welcome. And thank you for taking a moment today to focus in on the things of God. Have you ever stopped to wonder how it is that even though myself, all of us are such imperfect people that we can still have a fellowship with God? It's something that honestly none of us have ever earned or deserved. But there's a passage in 1 John chapter 2 in the first two verses that helps us understand what that relationship we have with God and the fellowship we have with God is all about. So in 1 John chapter 2, starting in verse 1, the Bible says, My dear children, I write to you this to you so that you will not sin. But if anybody does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only ours, but also the sins of the whole world. You know, probably a, a verse that I'm sure a lot of you have memorized is in Ephesians chapter 2 and verses 8 and 9, where the Bible says that we are saved by grace, through faith. And that's not coming from ourselves, that, that it's a gift of God and not by works, so none of us can boast. And it's probably one of the most simple and profound statements in the Bible, talking about what it means to be, as a lot of us would say, born again or, or to be saved. But at the same time, we know that the devil is trying to distort every truth of God. And because of that, a lot of people look at grace as sort of a license to do anything that they want. Well, God's got to forgive me, right? I mean, why even try? God understands I'm human. God understands I'm sinful. Uh, if God's really forgiving, he'll just forgive me. I won't have to, to do anything for it. He'll just forgive me. And that's why a lot of times, and, and if you have this, this bumper sticker on your car, you know, it's fine. But, you know, we're, we're, that we're not perfect, we're just forgiven. Well, a lot of people misunderstand the process of being forgiven. And the kind of, that kind of mindset in a Christian life can be devastating. It can destroy your fellowship with God. And it can keep you actually from maturing in your faith inevitably those those kinds of attitudes will even cause some Christians to doubt their salvation and the relationship that they have with Christ. So those two verses that we just read in 1 John, he's talking about that fellowship that exists between God and us. And he points out a privilege. It's something that's shared by all believers. You notice in verse 1, he says, my dear children, now, in that letter, 1 John, up to that point, he's kind of kept a formality about his writing. And also in that letter, up to this point, he's been laying down some positive guidelines about what he's calling darkness and light, or sin and righteousness. And he's very plainly taught that there's no blanket of forgiveness, that we, we do have to for, confess our sins. We have to acknowledge them and confess them before God. But now John's calling his readers dear children. And he uses that phrase six times in this letter. Uh, it's, a, it's a name that Jesus used when he was talking to his disciples. And we may not like to be thought of necessarily as children if we're adults. But when you think about children and think of it on a spiritual level, children are usually teachable. You can tell a child anything and that child will, will believe you. But also a child or a little person, they, they need more guidance. They can very quickly get into trouble because they don't have the life experiences to navigate some of the situations they get into. So John was basically saying, look, little children, as God has spoken to me, I, I'm uh, going to guide you step by step through this business of dealing with the sin in your life and, and helping you to maintain uh, a fellowship with God. But he also says here, he's writing this so that we won't sin. And that verb tense is important here. The word is sin here and not sins because it's suggesting uh, a certain sin uh, at a certain time that's committed. He's not talking about habitually sinning yet at this point. He's looking at sin as something that might happen in the life of a Christian. 
but it's not the thing that should be the norm. It should be unusual. We, we approach things differently. And again, not that we're perfect, but when we sin, it shouldn't be as often, I will say. So John's saying here, don't fall into sin. If Satan catches you at a weak moment uh, and you give into it, don't give up. Uh, don't believe that everything is lost because you've fallen into that sin. Because the devil has deceived a lot of people to think that, well, now you can't live a victorious Christian life because of a certain sin that you've given yourself over to over and over again. And there are even Christians out there who believe that they really can't live a meaningful Christian life because of some sin in their life. Well, that's why it's important to notice in this passage, John shows us a provision that God's made for his children. The end of verse one, starting into verse two, he said, if anybody does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins. And not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. So we have an advocate with the Father. This is one of the most comforting statements in this letter. We have someone who's been called to be our defender. And that word, that phrase here, is describing someone who gives legal counsel. Uh, but when you apply this to Jesus, it goes even deeper because it's not a legal relationship. We belong to him. He died on the cross for us. He redeemed us. If you're reading from the King James Version, it says that he is an advocate with the Father. And that word with describes someone who's facing another person, which means he's always in fellowship with the Father so that he can plead for those of us who are sinning. And in verse 2 in the King James Version, it calls Jesus a propitiation. Um, and in the NIV, it used the phrase atoning sacrifice, but a propitiation means a satisfaction. Uh, in his death on the cross, Jesus satisfied all of God's requirements concerning our sinfulness. So basically what John's doing here is warning Christians against sinning. And he's reminding us that the devil is always looking for opportunities to trap us in a sin. Sometimes we fall victim to those traps. But when we do, we have an advocate. There's a loving, understanding God who's made a provision for us. Jesus is our advocate. And when we genuinely repent of the sin in our life, Christ is there to plead our case before the Father and restore the broken relationship that we have with God because of our sin. It's an amazing thing when you think about what God has done for us through Jesus Christ. And I hope today that you could say that you've accepted him as your Lord and Savior. But if you haven't, now's the time to do that. I'm going to have a prayer with you. And I'd ask you to open your, your heart to Christ and let him speak to your life in a, in a way that maybe you've never heard him speak before. Let's pray together. Lord, again, we thank you for the blessing of a day that we're able to, to be here to serve you. And Lord, I, I'm thankful that you've given us that propitiation that atoning sacrifice. I'm thankful for Jesus Christ, our advocate. And Lord, I pray for those today who've never received him as Lord and Savior in their lives. And I pray that you would guide them to that decision, open their hearts to receive him in a way that will change them forever. And Lord, we lift ourselves up to you and pray that in all things, your will be done through Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen.